seminar. Treat it like a seminar. Hello. Hey. This is Ergo. It is. I am Damon. I am Kiss. And we are back with the Sawyer Seminar presenting Radical Care, Real Alternatives. On this third episode, we dive deep into a conversation around structural care. This episode is led and moderated by Jennifer Breyer, who is a professor of history and gender and women's studies at UIC. She talks with Kenyon Farrow, Charles Ryan Long, and Valencia Robinson about their decades of experience in HIV AIDS organizing and movement work and what lessons they've learned from that about how to take care of each other and how to respond to pandemic and epidemic. It's a really dynamic conversation with folks who are doing this work in different spaces. And just personally, I think we both really learned a lot from it. And I think we can unearth um, some of the marginalized lessons of how we need to be holistic and how we care for people. So with no further ado, let's get to this next episode of the Sawyer Seminar. Here we go. School of more stage like I'm doing a seminar. I'm doing a seminar. I'm doing a seminar. Hello to all of you. I hope you are all well. I was thinking about um, getting ready for today, and I was so struck by the fact that it's a year ago that we were all meant to be together, and how, I don't mean this in a sort of holier-than-thou way, but how prescient all of the work that we've been doing for a long time is in preparing us for this moment. And so I guess I wanted to start with that. So this is the third episode of the Sawyer Seminar and the Ergo podcast to talk about ideas of radical care and structural care. And it was all created in a world before COVID. And to now think about it in this, in this moment of COVID, I think really exposes a whole set of thinking and practices and organizing strategies, art making writing um, that have prepared us almost, or at least not allowed us to think that COVID was somehow special or unique or unprecedented in the, in the history of, of modern life. So I guess I wanted to start with that question. We're talking today with Charles Ryan Long, who is an artist and a Black liberationist, um, Valencia Robinson, who is the executive director of Mississippi in Action, an organization that is at the cutting edge of thinking about the relationship between reproductive justice and AIDS and sexual health, which is, in my opinion, far too unusual. And Kenyon Farrow, who is a longtime activist, writer, uh, organizer, who was at the body Uh, for a long time at Queers for Economic Justice, um, and now is in some new activist work in Cleveland, which I'm hoping he'll talk about. And I'm Jenny Breyer. I'm a professor of gender and women's studies and history at the University of Illinois at Chicago, and I've been writing about uh, the history of HIV AIDS for a long time, including uh, producing a living women's history of HIV in the United States. So, We could take it in any order, but could you all tell us a little bit of how you came to working in, on, through HIV AIDS? I can go first. Hi, Valencia, Hershey pronouns. Well, it was interesting because it was a public speaking class. I had to have a persuasive speech for my final. And I went home and it just so happened to be World AIDS Day in 2003. Then in 2003, uh, HIV was impacting Black women between the ages of 25 and 44 at a high rate. And so I was just sitting there just listening to the statistics and I was like, hey, that could be me. And so I was like, how do I do this speech? So I called the state AIDS director, got some information. And the more I learned, the more I wanted people to learn. And so it just took off from there. And it's interesting. My dad died in 1998. In 2008, at AIDS Watch, as a matter of fact, I met my uncle, which is my father's brother. And he asked me, what did I do back home? And I said, advocacy work for people living with HIV. And he asked me what inspired me to do that work within my father. You know, my dad was an alcoholic, so I thought he died from cirrhosis of the liver. 
And so from that point on, I knew I was in the work where I was supposed to be. And so that's how I got started and just started volunteering. And a year later, I got a job working at uh, one of the first aid service organizations here in Jackson, Mississippi, and just been running ever since. Yeah. Um, Charles, he, him. I'm a black gay man <laughs> and I have been for uh, 40 some years now. That means to me in some ways that HIV was always present in within the community or space. Professionally, um, I got probably got my first job um, working for Howard Brown, um, which is a pretty large now, not just LGBT health center, but um, kind of health provider all over the city of Chicago now. But I was the youth HIV specialist, and so I helped young people between ages of 16 and 24. I was the person you met. After the person gave you your diagnosis, I was there to help case manage you into care. And so that was the kind of professional, otherwise, first time. Um, I'm so glad to be here with uh, three people that I love and admire so much. Um, but I'll, I also am... Um, similar in age to Charles. I'm in my 40s. And so, you know, I kind of remember some of just the first, you know, news reporting about HIV as a kid. And also, uh, one of my aunts in the early 80s uh, had been married, but at that point divorced from uh, my mother's older brother who got sick and nobody could figure out what was wrong with her. And she died about a year after whatever illness has started to emerge. And subsequently, this was like 83, 84, and I'm from Cleveland, Ohio, where I believe that no one even thought to test her for HIV uh, or even consider it as part of her diagnosis because uh, she was a heterosexual Black woman, no history of drug use, or you know any of the things that would kind of be thought of as putting her at particular risk. And so it wasn't until some years after she died that the discovery of whatever the, the kind of cancer or pneumonia, whatever the kind of final you know, diagnosis of the cause of death, did my family start to understand and associate with probably HIV. Um, I was probably eight or nine or maybe 10 when that happened. And also as a Black gay man, it just informed so much of my, you know, sexual life as a, you know, coming into my sexuality in my uh, teenage years. And professionally, my first job in HIV was here in Cleveland, working for the ACE Task Force of Greater Cleveland under Earl Pike, if you know Earl, uh, who was at the time the director of education, and he later became the executive director of the organization. Um, and then when I moved to New York in 1999 and was doing a range of community organizing, um, I had like a part-time gig working at a career services organization in East Harlem also, um, did I start to really think about the broader just impact of HIV politically, one, as I was starting to then learn at that time in my like, you know, mid, late 20s, it was like a year or two where like, so many of my gay male friends, all black and brown men, either disclosed to me they were living with HIV or they serial converted and disclosed to me around that time. And uh, it became clear to me that that was going to also be a part of my work as an activist. Um, and um, that was kind of how I got involved uh, in a you know long term way, probably around the early mid 2000s. Those are really powerful stories. Um, I'm been thinking a lot about Charles and I are together in this organizing entity called What Would an HIV Doula Do? We're thinking a lot about this anniversary of, of AIDS that's coming up, which of course is not an anniversary that any of our stories fit into. And really thinking about how long the traditions are that can bring us to this work. It's interesting, like you've all talked about different ways in and different traditions that brought you to it. What do you think some of the the sort of traditions are that you bring to it? So I know that Charles talks about his work in the movement for Black lives and Black liberationist struggles. And Kenyon, you come to it from also these really important strategies around economic justice and sort of more traditional AIDS activism. And Valencia, you coming to it through 
your familial connections, but also other traditions of Black women community organizing in Mississippi. So I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about that, how you see those traditions as informing you today or when you first entered the work. Yeah, for me, I would say that um, I was very lucky in the sense that uh, when I was about uh, 14 or 15 years old, um, I got to see Marlon Riggs' film Tongues Untied when it premiered on PBS. Uh, people who know me know I tell this story all the time, but you know, my mother used to always make us watch every PBS kind of like documentary, uh, you know, Eyes on the Prize, How the West Was Lost, which was about, you know, genocide of Native Americans and uh, and the expansion of the U.S., et cetera. And so when Tongues Untied um, premiered, she decided that it was something that me and my sister should see. And she also felt because it was being used by, you know, former North Carolina Senator Jesse Helms and some other Republicans as kind of a political football to try to defund the uh, National Endowment of the Arts and the uh, Corporation of Public Broadcasting. And I, I raise that because I think in a lot of the historicizing of like what had national impact in terms of HIV, like Tongues and Tide gets left out of it. People sort of talk about it as a as a film and Black gay men, but actually it actually had national political story that I think people forget. But um, for me, seeing at age 14, 15, um, you know, that documentary with Black gay men who were pro-feminists, who were in community with each other, who were artists and poets and writers and, uh, you know, trying to also kind of navigate their lives and their survival in that point in the epidemic was really important to me. And, you know, my mother now says that she had some inklings that her son was gay (laughs) and wanted me to see that. Um, And so for me, that and the sort of connection between culture and using writing as 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 a form of activism Again, connected to, uh, you know, kind of political struggle and that work also partly being driven by activism and the political organizing is definitely part of my strategy. I've, people have, you know, asked me, well, can, how come you haven't like, you know, published, you know, solo book projects of your own? It's just like, what, <laughs> you know, the moment that I could have the privilege to sit down somewhere and really do nothing but write, I have not had the privilege of doing that. <laughs> so like, you know, but the, the organizing work has fueled my and helped me kind of think through the uh, my kind of political analysis and vision that has shown up in the in the in the essay writing so i would say for me those things have been really important and and in the last few years i felt like it was really important for me to also kind of expand my knowledge and capacity around you know kind of science and uh healthcare infrastructure and the you know what people term the sort of biomedicalization of hiv because i felt like so much of that work especially as things like you know treatment as prevention and prep were becoming more kind of widely viewed as sort of the central way of us out of the epidemic um, that there were just few Black people involved in, in those tables where decisions around research funding and healthcare implementation, those sort of things were happening that I wanted to learn those things. So for me, those have been uh, some of the things that have in, informed my, my work. There are so many things in here that we could loop together. Um, so you could answer the question, which was, what are some of the traditions that you feel like bring you to this work and help you here? Or pick up on this really sharp analysis that Kenyon is offering about the political strategy of art and writing as a way of beautifully intervening in the idea that something biomedical is completely separate from art and writing. Yeah, I I think, you know, because of the intimate, um, identity-based relationship of being a Black gay man of a certain age, growing up in a certain time um, that related my life to AIDS. It's tied so directly with my Blackness, right? Or like my beingness. Um, And, you know, I think I retreated from direct service work or activist work within the HIV AIDS context, which I was in for like, you know, a good decade of work, right? Um, providing direct service, both here in Chicago, as well as in New York, and on a, um, doing advocacy work on a national and international space. That really took a lot out of me, right? It, tr- it, it pulled something out of my 
moving body and 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 so there was this this pushback to to art right and so went back got another degree uh, in paper making here in Chicago at Columbia College and really did this like midlife shift where I was going to turn away from movement and only put beautiful things into the world and not really deal with you know the ills of it anymore right because I'm a poorest person and I can't just simply walk away from work every day I, I, I carry everything that happened in the day with me at the same time, simultaneously, right, you know, this is now, right, six, seven years ago. So my brown is killed in Ferguson, um, igniting this very kind of what felt like and still feels like a, a, a new evolution in civil rights work, right, that's so tied to queerness, identity, in terms of the leadership, in terms of who's leading, um, in terms of what we're talking about and how we're directly confronting it. I think it was almost this this meeting of worlds in terms of direct action and taking from tactics uh, along the long history and arc of all of that work of which HIV AIDS, you know, used a lot of. Um, and then moving back that into that with like a very particular Black queer feminist lens. And now I've arrived at this place where it's a mishmash of all of those things. And it feels responsible to, in my public life, really, you know, be really unapologetically Black and, and expressive. But then in my artwork, also expressing that and, and looping in conditions of care and conditions of uh, rage that need to be in place in both of those arenas in order to not only deal with the problem, but to survive dealing with the problem, right? The ultimate lesson for me was that at any given point in time, I had more or less of the other one and never really related them so directly. Um, and I think it's actually what Black queer feminisms teach us is that they you cannot uh, separate out the care along with the anger at the systems that you're trying to upend you know, they're rooted in caretaking. That's so interesting, Charles. Um, Valencia, I want to get you into this part of the conversation and then maybe we could move out from there. Can you tell us a little bit about the traditions that you try to inhabit in the work that you do? So this is interesting because I've always said I didn't have the language, you know, like organizing and I just saw something was wrong, had a problem, and nobody was doing anything to help solve the problem. I just did what I knew to do. You know, it was no formal training, no nobody helping. You're too this, you're too that, you're pissing everybody off. But I've always been that person. I've always, if I had to stand alone in the work, I stood alone. I was not people's favorite person because I didn't go along to get along. You know, your mama used to say, don't lie, tell the truth. That's what I did. And the truth, you know, sometimes it was ugly, but the work needed to be done. In a place like Mississippi, it's hard. I tell people the things that you all are talking about now around HIV, I was told by a former state AIDS director, don't bring big city ideas to Mississippi. People getting med on medication, that's a big city idea. Oh, talking about sex? Is a big city idea. So I was up against a lot, um, even people in the work. In Mississippi, there was not a lot of services. So you can't piss the three people off that provide the service. You know, it's very territorial, you know, with these organizations. These are my people. These are my clients. Uh, when we start really doing advocacy work, it was, you can't talk to them. You know, if y'all ain't getting what you need from this organization, there are other organizations you could go to. They really felt like they owned people that you can't go to this meeting, especially if you're in a housing program. If you're in a program that's helping uh, people get their medication, they really would cut people off if they started to speak out. So it was hard trying to organize and given, you know, we in Mississippi, we had a stigma around HIV. Well, the stigma around sex, period, in, in the great state of Mississippi, nobody's having sex. We're just praying and eating. Uh, but especially, you know, I'm not in the church like talking about it. But the thing that I always brought was love 
and compassion. If you don't have those two, do not come. You you can't say that you want to effectively make change if you can't love the person and have some kind of compassion and empathy. You know, you don't have to have sympathy, but have empathy because at the rate things were going, it was always somebody, somebody, and we got people engaged and involved only when something happened to somebody close. So it, it's pretty much the tradition I brought was got to love everybody and help them. Like I was saying, I worked for a service organization, but we only could service people living with HIV. But people not living with HIV came in as well, but we couldn't serve them based on the funding that we received. So that means we had to turn them around. It was a turning point for me when we talk about holistic work. I left because I was doing testing, counseling, and education, and I left that piece and started doing advocacy and policy work. And like I said, I had no form of education, nothing. And so it was a learning process. Um, so it was not CDC or not a doctor saying use holistic practices. Nobody thought about that, not especially here. They didn't look at the whole person, only what they were getting funded to do. But now you hear a lot of holistic work, holistic, holistic, holistic. And I just feel like we, some of us, were so far ahead of the time in a state like Mississippi. You know, I, I think our numbers would have decreased if we would have thought about putting people in care earlier. But CDC didn't say it. And so we were not taking chances. And we also have crazy laws on the book. HIV criminalization stopped a lot of people from getting tested because, hey, you know your status, then you're accountable. And, you know, we talk about faith and religion. It's a Bible scripture that I always quote. When I was hungry, did you feed me? When I was thirsty, did you give me a drink? When I was in jail, did you come to see me? If you did those for my brother, you've done those for me. That was Jesus speaking. And so I was like, if this is the way I want to come from a religious perspective, this is the Bible scripture that I'm, I ride with. And so um, people started looking and wanting to get involved. But like I say, those are my traditions, just bringing empathy and love. Thank you for that, Valencia. Um, I wonder if, if we could talk a little bit more specifically. Valencia raised it and as did Kenyon and, and Charles. This question of like what care looks like, what it feels like, what it is. I mean, I think we so often focus on care as the delivery of medical care. And so much of the work that you all are describing is how inadequate a definition that is. And also how much it doesn't even come close to describing the work that you undertake. So maybe if we could just hear a little bit about that, what you think care looks like, what you would like it to look like, what you would like it to to be. Uh, I can jump in there real quick. I think for me, off the top of my head, uh, you know, I think it looks like uh, defunding the police. I think it looks like the multiple efforts of mutual aid and disaster aid Specifically, if we talk about the recent storms that were in Mississippi and Texas and uh, Tennessee and, and, you know, that's what the alternatives, right? Um, so what do we mean when we say divest, invest? We want to defund the police and fund other things. Care looks like building refugee spaces for the black and brown people who will be displaced by climate disaster on the coast in major cities, right? And, you know, it looks like um, black trans women leading organizations and efforts that to shift narrative care looks different like physically different like who's in charge looks different who is a decision maker is different because that's the level of care that we need to combat the things that both i think valencia and king and touched upon which is the siloing of black life you're only this thing you're a patient and so you you exist in your something to be served and not an advocate for your own survival. And, and so uh, care looks like debunking the myth 
that um, we do not live intersectional lives. And in our lived lives, we are all very aware that we're not singular beings. <laughs> um, and so like the concept is just, it's baffling that it would, it need, we need extensive academic research and, and, and validation to actually begin to see people uh, in this way. Care looks like no more of that bullshit and no, no more needs for those type of terms to be invented and, and, and used as a justification for why we should have compassion for each other. Yeah, I also think that care to me looks like accountability. And I think this goes to both things that Charles and Valencia have talked about, you know, even in the space of whether you're talking about, you know, public health or HIV specific organizations or et cetera, the dynamic of care in the sense of like social services, right? looks like a very top down we know what's best for you frame and that there's also just no accountability for how organizations or you know public institutions like your local health department or what have you have over you know how they sort of engage with uh people's lives to kind of expand on some things that like valencia talked about you know I've seen this happen in Mississippi and <laughs> Valencia and I've worked together before and in some other places where, you know, if you complain as a person seeking services about how you're being treated or the lack of follow through or, you know, with staff and just other things like that that are really important for people's real survival in a lot of ways, and you are cut off either as an employee or a, a client in a place, that could mean that you you don't have any place to go. Either if you want to work in this field, right, locally, um, if there's one or two games in town or three places that sort of do this work in a small city, then you're screwed, right? Because you decided to either stand up for yourself or your clients or the way an organization has been, or people at organizations have behaved in community, et cetera, right? So there's there's lack of accountability in that place. The more longer I am kind of in this work, the more I'm really thinking about not just the when we do a lot of kind of advocacy and organizing, it's usually about sort of policy change, legislative change, and those things are important frameworks, but if we don't have systems that also not just change policy or laws, but actually give people who are most impacted and in need of, and are frankly paying into the very services that they get, if they don't, we don't have mechanisms for people to be able to actively direct and inform and shape what the delivery of those things look like in communities, we have a bunch of problems. And it's, it, to me, speaks to some of the larger things we're seeing socially with, you know, people don't trust public institutions, right? Because, you know, some of it, you know, has to do with 50 years of right-wing spin about <laughs> publicly funded institutions and et cetera. But some of it is also because people have terrible experiences when they go to places, whether it's the welfare office or the STD program at the health department or the driver's licensing bureau, <laughs> whatever it is. And so I'm thinking more about how do we develop not just organizing and kind of models that get at policy change, but infuse that change with real accountability mechanisms that communities can participate in to really guide and shape how those institutions comport themselves in community. Oh my goodness. I was thinking policy, what that looks like, care. When you have policies and laws in place in Mississippi, you know, our governor prided himself in signing the bill, which takes effect July 1, that trans women can't participate in sports. The state prides itself on a criminalizing people living with HIV for saliva, prides itself on not having comprehensive sex education, prides itself on a law that gives the state workers the right to discriminate against LGBTQ people, but also doctors, lawyers, judges, and everybody else is taking that law and using it too. An ambulance can deny you services if you're an LGBTQ person or they perceive that you're an LGBTQ person and we can't do anything about it. So care looks like for me, people in the Capitol building actually knowing what's going on out here in community, but that we have people in the building that looks like community 
Then it comes down to our local officials. Oh, God, y'all just don't. The health department, they've forgotten about HIV. They gave people contracts, small organization contracts, y'all, recently. But they wrote the proposal for each individual organization to tell them what they were going to do. And if you said, no, this is not what I'm going to do, they did not give you the money. For me, care looks like you listening to the community and not you telling the community what is needed. Care looks like, like Charles said, defunding the police. Care looks like policing our own communities with projects like credible messengers and violence interrupters training that I'm a part of. Getting to the problem before there is a problem. That's what care looks like for me. I just wanted to add in too, though, like the accountability piece that is being lifted up here. What I mean when I say that the people who are decision makers need to look different, it's in a very literal way, right? Because like we don't all hold accountability in the same way. And I think that or even feel accountable to each other in the same way. And so it feels very 90s to talk about, uh, you know, the need of like diversity and it's all DUI or shortened to equity and all the, you know, all these sub terms, but they're, they've been incremental, kinder, gentler suffering points for black and brown and poor people and continue to be ways of placating the actual true care that we need, which is that we just need to be autonomous in our own decision makers. And we need systems on policy level decisions and other systems to allow that to be possible. But what I actually think is going to happen on the other side is a um, dismantling of those said systems, right? The abolition of of those spaces uh, to create a whole new thing that we haven't actually, we don't even know about yet because we actually need to get there in a much different way. And we won't if we continue to ask white men to give us something, cis and straight, but not necessarily. When we were first talking about doing this over a year ago, I was really interested in developing this idea of structural care as a response with equal force and scope to structural violence. And and that was before COVID-19 basically laid bare what it means to say that structural violence or structural inequality fuels epidemics. There's no way to understand COVID-19 outside of that context. And so thinking about structural care, the scope of that looks so different and that the way we understand COVID-19 is as much about what SARS-CoV-2 does to human bodies, but also how it disproportionately affects communities of color, indigenous, black, Latino communities. And then also, of course, the way the movement for black lives was crystallized over the summer for many people. Um, And then, of course, the election, all of these things. So it's like, if you understand structural care as a way of addressing structural violence or structural inequality, you get a really different picture. So I guess I want to hear how COVID-19 has affected your work in care and thinking about what structural care might look like or what it means to be still thinking about AIDS in a time of COVID. And I also just want to hear how you're doing, like how it's been. Uh, So first, just how I'm doing, how it's been, you know, for the past year, I think I have you know, personally felt like I was able to manage the social distancing and the, you know, all of the kind of isolation for a while. Like this January is when it really, I started to just kind of freak out and have like, frankly, more anxiety than I think I have ever experienced after um, the sort of like shutdown. So there's that. I think in terms of how COVID-19 has kind of impacted my um, work or just where I, I think things should go. Uh, for me, it has actually made the the call for Medicare for All even more important. I've been even more disappointed, frankly, in HIV Inc. and its complete abandonment for, for the most part of any real fight for uh, comprehensive single-payer health care in this country. And all the evidence, even when you look at research studies about HIV, point to it. There have been 
you know, some recent studies that have shown that when you compare, you know, people who have private insurance plans, which is to say a comprehensive health package, right, as opposed to only have their HIV care covered through Wine White, that the people who have the comprehensive health care actually have higher viral suppression rates and better health than people who are just getting Ryan White. And yet we continue to sort of package our policy as around kind of saving Ryan White, as opposed to actually fighting for something bigger. A study just last week showed that the states that expanded Medicaid actually have had greater decreases in HIV incidents due to just Medicaid alone, which is to say publicly funded health insurance that just was offered to people by virtue of being a citizen of that state, actually not only people found out that they had HIV who had probably not been diagnosed before, had probably not sought medical care, had any kind of preventative proactive care outside of using emergency rooms in a crisis. And so to me, I'm becoming and am going to be over the coming months, <laughs> as you will, you will soon see, really calling out more honestly and more forcefully the HIV movement for not getting behind Medicare for All. I just looked at the list of organizational sponsors for the, the new Medicare for All bill that was reintroduced in Congress on March 17th. And there are, as far as I could see, only two national HIV organizations that endorsed. Meanwhile, the NAACP has now endorsed, and you have more congressional sponsors than they've ever had for a Medicare for All bill. So there's no political threat. And, and what we have, I think, become as an HIV community, and I'm not the first to say it, but, you know, that there's more incremental neoliberal infusion and, and less people who are actually willing to fight for a different kind of public health and a different kind of healthcare system that would actually benefit people living with HIV and people more vulnerable to HIV. And instead, what we're fighting for is, is the survival of specific organizations and institutions who, who thrive more under the current system, even if it doesn't serve people that it's supposed to. That's really a, an amazing gloss on such a critically important issue. And it picks up on so much of what Valencia was saying about what it means to only be able to serve people who have HIV, as opposed to the fact that there are just any number of ways of reconfiguring it. Like, one would be, we're all potentially HIV positive. We all live with HIV. That's what Charles, you know, he uses that language, people living with AIDS, by which we mean everyone on the globe. Like we're all living with HIV. Some of us live with it outside of our bodies, but we're all affected by it. And then of course, the reality that COVID-19 and the way that the vaccine rollout has happened. And I say this every time I say it, like, Everybody should accept a vaccine when it is offered to them. And we can talk about all of these other things. But we also have to agree fundamentally that vaccines are not going to make us healthy. They're going to keep us from getting COVID, but they're not going to keep us healthy. And I think we really have to have that conversation that biomedical treatments are not the things that are going to make us well. It's not going to produce community well-being. It's not going to produce individual well-being especially if we say that the only people who can get health care are the people who are sick, <laughs> you know, so. Yeah, um, the ice storm here in COVID here in Mississippi has shown me the systems that's supposed to help people are not helping people. Um, I'm always saying we have to get back to the village. I contracted COVID the week of Thanksgiving. And I went to the doctor and it really opened my eyes because, you know, they gave me the, the test and was like, oh, yeah, you know, you tested positive for COVID. Didn't say what I needed to do, if I needed to do anything. Just, hey, you, you tested positive. Go forth and quarantine. No other uh, information was given to me. I didn't know what to do. I thought I was going to die. I was going to lose my mind. But at the same time, it was myself, my mom, my daughter-in-law, my sister. We all contracted COVID. But it showed me, you know, it was like I didn't have insurance at that time. And they was like, well, that's okay. We can put it on the care act. I just got a $465 bill. <laughs> I was like, I thought I was putting it on the care act. Um, but they're still trying to bill me when, you know, it was said that this is how it could get paid. So if 
I didn't really understand it, but I, I knew a little about insurance. But what about people who went to get tested or went to the doctor, was in the hospital, and they know nothing? They, you know, they probably told them the same thing. That's okay. The CARES Act, we get the CARES Act to pay for it. And now they have $1,000 bills that they can't afford to pay. I don't know. I just, for me, I saw community really coming together. I saw people putting food on people's porches, just staring at the window, saying hi because of the quarantine. And then we also talked about domestic violence went up, child abuse went up, and even people not even understanding the conversation about HIV actually came up during COVID because a young lady called in and said, everybody's thinking about COVID. Nobody's thinking about HIV anymore. And I contracted HIV because my boyfriend, who now is quarantined, has to be in this house with me. <laughs> she contracted HIV from him. And so that was a, a bigger conversation that we had to have. Uh, still, how do we get people tested during the quarantine? But we figured it out. <laughs> we figured it out. And we still got people tested during this whole pandemic. Because people wanted to know. That's how we've been working through this whole COVID thing. I, I want to respect people's time. And it's been such an incredible conversation. I think people have learned to the extent that they have learned what mutual aid can look like. It comes out of the traditions that you've all brought to this Zoom table tonight. Um, and just thinking about the, the sort of deep held practices of Black liberation and mutual aid and Black queer feminist practice, whether it's in poetry or in art making or in compassion that Valencia talks about. People have used this phrase, AIDS Inc. That should be the traditions that they look to to understand why we need to return to a different model of care at this moment in time. And also that, that you all have been talking about structural care as a response to the structural violence of how HIV is part of our, our lives for a very long time, whether you were using the term HIV and care or not. And so I hope that people can hear that um, when they listen to this podcast. I wanted to just give everyone uh, one more chance at a last word, anything that you're thinking about or that you want people to take with them from listening to this conversation among the, among the three of you. I would just say that um, I think that the you know conversations that have been happening in COVID um, about this kind of concept of mutual aid, I think is really important. And I also want to also make a sort of plea <laughs> to the left and movements that we also need not abdicate our role in helping to push and transform institutions. If we kind of abdicate the role of institutions and, and governance in the broadest sense of the term, right, we get what we are getting, which is right wing takeovers. And so I think we need to think about how do we sort of do both. And there we have lots of movement examples of how you, you know, both provide for mutual aid and community support. And I think we need to be thinking about what are the ways in which we can actually transform institutions to actually support mutual aid, right? And more uh, democratizing those institutions in ways that support communities and community builders. Charles or Valencia? Just don't give up. Um for me, it's not work. This is my life. This is my lived experiences that we're dealing with. And I think if we don't look at it as work and just a survival, we could really do other things. And we have to stop depending on government. And I do feel like the model of taking the village and helping each other and, and loving on each other, even in this, in this time, we can do better about helping each other. Yeah, for me, it's uh, both and, right? Let's continue to explore and create what we want to see and not be afraid and unapologetic. Um, but let's also work within the spaces where we are and where we're coming from and where we feel like we have the most impact. Uh, it's the love and the rage. 
it doesn't even have to be dichotomous. I think, you know, we're just at the, there's an ellipsis at the end of that, right? We can continue to add things on as a part of that stew. That's just what I'm kind of on and promoting as the, the, the rue that we started with, with all of the pieces of what's possible and what we're owed, frankly. That's a perfect ending, I think.